Good evening. Welcome to Global Dialogue. I'm Peter Haslund. My guest is Mark Jurgensmeyer. Uh, Professor Jurgensmeyer uh, teaches global studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and I have the privilege of calling him both friend and colleague. Uh, we've known each other for many years. Uh, the field of global studies, Mark, is, uh, is new, new in the sense that it isn't exactly a discipline, it's an interdiscipline. So the first time you went into a classroom to talk to your students about this, this new thing, how did you explain it? Well, I told them about myself, and that's probably the best way to explain global study, explain how I got interested in it, and which is, I think, paradigmatic of the way in which a lot of people have gotten interested in global studies as a field of study. And, and that's the realization is that it changes the nature of the world in which we're in. Now, for the last 20 years or so, I've been studying religious terrorism around the world. Uh, you, know, you know about Al-Qaeda, but you might not know about Buddhist terrorists in Sri Lanka or Hindu activists in India or, or Christian terrorists in the United States. There are new forms of religious extremism all over the world. So when I started off working on this topic, I said one of the central questions is, why is this happening now? I mean, is it just coincidence that almost every part of the world and every religious tradition, there are these kinds of outbursts of religious activism at this particular moment in history? I mean, it couldn't purely be coincidence, right? What is happening all over the world? And what's happening all over the world is globalization, a weakening of the nation state, new forms of interaction, communication, transnational ideologies, which is able to reshape people's sense of themselves and their relationship to society, new forms of authority and new ways of challenging established forms of authority. We, we live in an, in an age that is characterized in ways we haven't even thought about by global conditions. So in order to understand very specific local phenomena, I had to understand the kind of major large-scale transitions that are going on in the world. Sure. And that's true of a lot of my colleagues. So when we got together, we realized this is not simply something that's important for research, although it certainly is important for research. It's also important to our students because they're going into a global world. They're going into a world, whether they're in business or teaching or in NGO work or working media, whatever they're in, they're going to be in a world that's shaped and changed and affected by globalization. They're going to become global citizens. This, this weakening of the nation state that you, you used to describe the, the globalization process, in, in a sense it was quite deliberate. I mean it was a, a relaxation of, 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 of the boundaries or barriers to, for example, trade. Mm -hmm. So th there was intentionality behind it. But that intentionality leading to globalism or a globalization process um, carried with it the expectation that as we got to know each other better, we'd, we'd like each other better. What happened? Or hate each other more. <laughs> well, I think that's... You know, you know about familiarity. Uh, yeah. it, it doesn't always breed affection. <laughs> yeah, but know, so what happened? The, the, the expectation was still there. This yeah. was... The, many argued that globalization was the way that we're going to achieve some sort of a global peace. Didn't happen. Didn't happen, and, and, and I think, you know, along with intentionality is also opportunity. That is, the changes and transformations are not just economic, but also in terms of communication. And now, instantly, we can contact anyone everywhere. Uh, anonymously, if we want, you know, on the internet, nobody knows we're a dog. We can be whoever we want to, and you can interact with people everywhere. And the massive shifts of population. Nowadays, everybody can live everywhere and do, mm -hmm. and still communicate back with their home place. And this creates in Southern California one of the world's great global cities. You know, it really is. Yeah, it's an important city in California. LA and the whole larger Southern California uh, environment, but it's also a, just a microcosm of the planet. And, and if you're living in Little Manila, if you're living in Little Saigon, or if you're living in Monterey Park and in the Chinese community, you're also connected with your people back home. There are all these multiple identities 
which is terrific, but it's also a bit maddening. And, and How is it maddening? In an era of globalization, there are three critical issues. Who are we? And identity. When the old nation state doesn't have that kind of defining power. Uh, you, know, you used to know what a Frenchman was. He was a you know, Catholic and uh, spoke French. And you now a Frenchman might be from Algeria and, <laughs> and, and be Muslim. Uh, so, so who are you? And, and, and who's in charge? Accountability. You know, when, when everything is everywhere and, and whether it's the internet or whether it's commerce, it's done by transnational organizations and transnational flows and operations. They're not under control of any state. Uh, operations. So who's who's in charge? And then third, maybe more important, security. How can we be safe? How can we be secure? How can there be how can there be a, a sense of location that I'm going to feel comfortable? So there's no. It's understandable that there is unrest, deep personal unrest as well as social unrest, and, and it's also understandable that religion is a part of this because religion provides identity, provides accountability provides a sense of security. Let's talk about that last part first, a sense of security. Mm -hmm. uh, one might hypothesize that as we got to know each other better, we'd feel less intimidated, less threatened. We would increase our sense of security. But that didn't happen either. That didn't happen, and yet it's also happening. Um, and that's the curious the curious thing, under the radar of the more visible kind of conflicts and the, and the real sense of insecurity that's produced through globalization, I think is quite genuinely a different kind of person. I think a global citizen is being produced out of the cosmopolitan character of contemporary societies without our even thinking about it. I mean, you and I travel around the planet and we deal with our colleagues in Rome and Beijing and Saigon. I know you do, Peter. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't lie. You've got your frequent flyer miles. Uh, but you know, everybody, to some extent, has these kind of global connections. Uh, all, all of us now are, are wired in, <laughs> almost literally in a computer age, but, but are connected uh, to other people around, around the planet. Is this and a generational we, thing? It's partly generational, uh, but I think even uh, people of our age feel it. You can't exist on the planet today without feeling a planetary connection, yeah. which can be scary. Yeah. It was, it was frightened, you know, frightened people who, are, who used to be secure in their own little location and used to feel like they were boss because of their ethnicity or their gender or, or, uh, or their politics, and now they are all competing uh, competing attempts for leadership and presence in the global arena. And that could be discombobulating. Sure. But it also, ultimately, it can give a sense of a global family, a global community, which I think in the long run, in the long run, I think will lead to a greater sense of global harmony. Joe White, who was on this program a week ago or so, talked about um, his expectations on the millennials. Mm -hmm. who may be more likely to be the kind of global citizen that, that you had in mind. More and, but, yes, but there's always a but. Uh, go to a high school cafeteria, not that I do this all the time, but I'm told, <laughs> most segregated place on the planet is high school lunches. Because at the high school cafeteria table, all the Hispanics sit together, all the Filipinos sit together, all of the Caucasians, all the Mormons, the, the jocks have their own table. Uh, you see the tribalization mm -hmm. uh, that comes in that's the other part of this, uh, this sense of all being a part of the homogenous family. Then if we're all part of the homogenous family, who am I? And what's special about me? What is my... Tradition, my so the millennials also are recovering in many cases a lost ethnic ad identity. I'm, I, I have you know Muslim uh, uh, people of my family, of my of my age who've been in this country for years. So what's happened to my kids? My kids have grown up in this country, and now they are becoming like super Muslim. They're becoming Islamists. They're 
Our daughter, and this is true sometimes, a daughter wearing the hijab, uh, and the parents never did this. Uh, Sikhs, where the young men are wearing their beard and the turban, and older Sikhs never did this in California. The, it's young people often who are discovering an identity that, that they never had before, in part because we're living in a globalized society. And yet, the other thing that you said is also happening. Mm. You know, there, there, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's complex and it's confusing, but I, I think you're right. And ultimately, it's this larger sense of family that will make a difference and that will endure in the present moment of tribalization. Let's talk about religion for a minute, because we hear so much about religious mm -hmm. strife, and, and it's, as you pointed out, it, it's almost inevitable, if not inevitable, it, it's certainly common practice that all religions have their inner strife, and it seems to me it's linked to, mm, to the loss of identity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Maybe not. but. Tell me, how does, how does that square with you? Sure. Um, uh, um, do, there, there, does the American force in Iraq or in Afghanistan, does that constitute a threat to Islam? You know, it all depends what, about what you mean by threat. all depends what you mean by Islam. I mean, religion, after all, is simply a language for describing and articulating what is significant in people's lives. So it can mean all kinds of things. And, and so what's significant in our lives is, a, is an ultimate longing for peace, a security, a kind of meditative quiet in the midst of chaos. And religion, religious language, religious images, religious tradition conveys that. But what's important in our life also is struggle uh, and being in midst an encounter and wanting somehow to survive with dignity, to triumph, to become victorious against the forces that, that we feel are trying to tear us apart. And religious language and tradition is full of that. Every religious tradition has images of war, has images of conflict, has images of struggle. Uh, but beyond that struggle in every religious tradition, there is, a, there is peace, there is victory, there is some harmony. Uh, that's at the goal, and that is a wonderful kind of statement about the way in which we feel we live, the, the kind of life that is in a, a churned up in this horrible maelstrom of ordinary living, uh, and, and the hope that that through the struggle there will be some uh, you know brighter day. Where do we find the harmony between Shia and Sunni Muslims? The, the harmony has been been a part of the tradition. There, there's never been more uh, uh, clash between Shia and Sunni than than there, through, throughout history than there is today. Really, I mean, yes, there have been moments in history, including, of course, the very beginning of Shiism. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there are moments of of, of strife, but uh, let's take Iraq, which, for you know, for even though it's a new country on the planet. Uh, the Shia and the Sunni lived together quite peacefully. Baghdad was always a city for intermarriages and interrelationships. Uh, um, people never thought about their religious identity until we came in, Americans, and liberated Iraq, and, which is a good thing in the sense that there was a very despotic leader, but at the same time, what's going to replace him? And what replaced him was a new politics democratic to be sure, based on the people, but what people and how then are they going to regroup themselves politically? And that's where religion became a convenient kind of thing to latch on to in a political sense for, uh, for, for uh, political identities. And so the heightening of ethnic uh, loyalties it really is a very new thing within contemporary uh, Iraq. It's a very new thing in many parts of the planet. Uh, the conflict in Israel and Palestine, and up until about 20 years ago, was largely over territory, not over religion, not over religious visions over what Israel should be and what Palestine means within the Islamic culture. Uh, all, all that's been a relatively new thing. So 
globalization is not always a good thing. You know, it leads to a new sense of tribalization as well as a new sense of global community. And you and I want the community to win out. And inshallah, God willing, uh, whatever deity you want to pray to, that will happen. But maybe not as soon as we might like. I think the general point of confusion for for a general audience is most the, the perception is that religious conviction carries with it a sense of of uh, peaceful resolution and living together in harmony, which it does. And conflict and war, which it also does. Right. Um, so human, isn't it? Well, yeah, we are that. <laughs> uh, I, but I was under the impression that prior to... No, religion is so human. I mean, it, it's, after all, it's a language that people use to talk about ultimate concerns. And you can say, oh, it's religion's fault, as if religion somehow was disembodied from human activity and mm -hmm. imagination. It's not. You know, let's go back to the problem. It's us. It's us. So the solution is getting rid of us? Or <laughs> is, there, is there hope? Is there hope yeah. out there? that somehow, in, in this particular struggle between, just for example, uh, Shia and Sunni, is there hope for an accommodation between these two uh, factions of, of the same religion so that um, there might be peace in Iraq or in Afghanistan? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, I really think the kind of rigidification of religion, which is a very recent phenomenon around the planet, including in Christianity, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in Christianity, just you know, 20 or 30 years ago, there was mainstream Protestantism, which is the dominant force of Protestant Christianity. And now, evangelical movements and highly politicized Christian movements have kind of moved in to really reshape um, our kind of an image of what pious Christianity is all, is all about. It's a really this rigidification attempt to try to define a religious community around particular norms and, and particular rules of identity is a fairly new thing. And, and it's you know, transforming Indonesia. I was just at lunch talking with about the problem in Indonesia. It used to be so tolerant. Islam in Indonesia we used to be so accepting of so, such a, and it's even in Indonesia, it's, it's changing. It's it becoming not as bad in some parts of the world, but, uh, but it's becoming more rigid, a little bit, they're pushing more to try to define what a real Muslim is. And so if you're an Ahmadiyya, for example, in one of these minority communities, and you're kind of, pushed out and it becomes a very difficult thing. So it is, that's the tribalization part of this contemporary moment, but that's not, that's not the last word. That's a, that's a particular, we're, it's a moment of transition and the moments of transition in world history always bear the kind of uh, tensions of that transition and we, we, beyond it I think, will be a kind of resolution uh, that makes it um, possible for people to accept each other for the people that they are. Talk a little bit more about this transition and maybe, I, I don't know what time frame we're talking about, but mm -hmm. is there a, a, a sense of five years, ten years down the line, uh, those who have felt threatened by the intrusion of the West as a consequence of globalization, that they might say, well, we can accommodate. Yes, I think so. And what's going to ha make that happen? Yeah, I think so. What, what a, a thing I think will happen is the people owning globalization from within their own cultures. Because f within, from the vantage point of America, it's hard for us to see the way in which American culture, particularly popular culture, has affected the rest of the world. Uh, being now, being so quickly, instantaneously conveyed all over the world and how offensive that is, to many people within uh, traditional communities. But there are now whole new um, epicenters of media production in different parts of the world. Nigeria now is becoming a major uh, video uh, production center. We've all always known about Bollywood in India, uh, but uh, uh, other parts of, of Asia are becoming very important in, in, in media production. And as Globalization in terms of popular culture, for example, and that's just one example, is right. owned from different parts of the world as no longer seen as simply an American project. 
uh, then I think, for one thing, we in America will be able to appreciate and share in the culture, uh, including the popular culture projected from other parts of the world. But also, globalization will be seen as a much more uh, integrated thing, a much not a not something that's being pushed on people by the bully West, by big America pushing its values on other people, but rather for what it really is more of a sharing of experiences. One of your earlier books talked about terrorism and religious mm -hmm. terrorism in particular, mm -hmm. and I remember you, you did a, a series of interviews with people who w were clearly identified as terrorists. They blew things up. Yeah. Um, what, what, is there a simple way of explaining the motivation of somebody who is a terrorist? Tell you about Mahmoud Abu Lima. This is a guy who was involved, the chief conspirator in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, and and part of the larger Al Qaeda jihadi network. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was all tied together, and some of the same people were connected with uh, the Sheikh Mohammed in the 9/11 mm -hmm. attack. So when I interviewed him, he was in, had been imprisoned, uh, but he was brought to trial, imprisoned in Lompoc Federal Penitentiary, and so. It took me forever to get into the penitentiary to talk with him. They shut the whole thing down. They had guards in the cafeteria. They closed it all down so I could talk with this guy. And at one point, uh, when I was trying to understand, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Mark, he said, you people just don't get it. He said, you're like sheep. You know, the government has hidden from you. There's, what's really going on, Mr. Mark? I said, what's that? He said, there's a war going on, a battle between good and evil or right and wrong and religion and irreligion, and your government is the problem. He said, you people need to be shaken away. We need to grab you by the shoulders and shake you so you could see this great conflict. And I said, was well, that what happens when people blow up buildings? And he just looked at me and he smiled. He said, well, now you know. Well, now you know. So what he was telling me was he had a vision. He had a global vision. And, and his response to globalization was global conflict, seeing that this, that to there what, was a... To what end? A global, right now he felt that he was a victim in this global conflict. They needed to fight back. He saw, he saw Islamic culture as the victim of the Western attempt to control the world through culture, through economics, through politics, through milita militarily, and, and they were fighting back. Now, how, how is that going to end? Well, it's going to end when, he, when they no longer feel like they're being controlled, when they no longer feel like he uh, can so easily pin, as many people do, the, their own personal sense of alienation onto America as the fault, and I think that will happen with the increasing variation within globalization, with, with uh, the Al Jazeera's of the world owning you know, a good section of the global media, with the mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the new Nigerian production of, of television, w with the variety of global images, so it's not just uh, America, and, and they will see that, yes, I have a place within the global world, which is really the point. It gets back to the issue of identity and accountability. Everybody has to know that they have, they're welcome to this table. It's a big table. It's not just America's table. Globalization is a table big enough for everyone to be Welcome and to bring their own food. <laughs> you know, we're not going to force our Big Macs on everybody, even though that looks like what we're doing. You know, it, it's open to everyone. Can you can you offer some prediction about the the future of globalization in in a general sense? We're we're running almost out of time. Well, <clears throat> no, I don't have a crystal ball, but I but I but I I, I can tell you. Christ Globalization will be all anti globalization will always be a part of globalization. Sure. In other words, what we're talking about is not a trend but a pattern which has inherent within it tensions. Yeah. That it, it is certainly to be a part of the foreseeable future, but I think the long term trend is certainly one in which there will have to be global accountability over global problems. I mean, we're entering a state of global warming and climate change where just the severity of the environmental problems that we'll have to deal with on a global scale is going to force us to deal with this on a global scale. This doesn't obviously touch on culture and everything else, it's globalization, but 
but it's one example of how we are going, we have no choice. We're going to be forced as inhabitants of this planet to deal collectively with the situation that we're all a part of. And that, I think, is going to lead to some dramatic changes for a global future that's going to be a lot more positive. What kinds of changes on the American citizen? Let's say we're watching this program. Mm -hmm. Is this something I need to worry about? No, I, uh, you know, I, I think this, uh, this is something that uh, you can look forward to with a certain amount of enthusiasm. I mean, there's certainly going to be a rocky road for Americans in, in, in the future because we've taken our privileges so much for granted. And to be without some of these privileges, whether they're economic, a sense of status, a sense of uh, seeing our culture projected as uh, the only kind of culture uh, that's can be you know, legitimate around the world. Uh, we're going to have to live w much more modestly with other people on all levels. I just not just economically, but in terms of our own hubris and pride. What is so that? that's going to be awkward. What does that do to the American dream? <laughs> Enhances it. I mean, this is after all what made America what it was in the first place. The idea that out of many, there could be one. And what a Wonderful vision for the world. Out of many, there can be one. Mark Jurgensmeyer, you, you sound like an optimist, are you? <laughs> yes, I mean, at some point in my bones I am. I'm a pessimistic, I'm a realistic optimist. I'm a pessimistic optimist. I'm, I'm, I'm I think in the long run that uh, we are headed in a trajectory that has um, great possibilities, as well as just the most horrible pitfalls and I'm hoping we can reach the first by surmounting the latter. Mark Jurgensmeyer, thank you for being on Global Dialogue. My pleasure.